Okay, welcome to our afternoon sessions. We had some great topics this morning, some keynotes and panels, more about how visual technology is impacting business and humanity. And I'm honored to bring up our next uh, guest, Josh Elman from Greylock Partners. Come on up. Hey, Josh. Hey, Evan. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. So the goal is as interactive as possible. People are going to make pictures, and make videos, <laughs> and there's a couple 360 cameras out there. We don't know what's going to happen. Interact. Questions for me, questions for you, and the audience will ask questions. For the we last have drones minutes. flying around. Uh, yes, they're very silent <laughs> drones. Uh, we talked to Bijan yesterday about Lily Robotics, which is the flying camera and awesome. all this kind of stuff. Um, so give us, just to kick it off, in your own words, um, your Greylock's focus, uh, size, stage, and what you're most focused on. Um, cool. So Greylock, uh, as a firm, has been around 50 years. We're one of the very oldest venture capital firms, and we try to look for the same things in companies we look for ourselves, building enduring companies that are building enduring value that can really lay a foundation to be 50-year or more um, companies and really build, build platforms of the future. We really get excited about companies that, that understand how to build great network effects, whether they're consumer networks where lots of people come together, whether they're marketplaces where lots of transactions happen, whether they're data networks where the company amasses so much data that creates a real advantage to create and sell more and more products. And we see that like often, you know, we, we focus on consumer platforms. In the past, we've been involved in Facebook, LinkedIn, um, Airbnb, Pandora on the enterprise side. We've been involved in companies like Workday and Palo Alto Networks and App Dynamics. You know, and then you know, I personally, um, we're a billion dollar fund. We focus mostly on Series A and Series B investments, writing checks anywhere from seven million up to 25 or so you know, in, a, in a Series B, or you know, we take real you know, board positions. We really roll up our sleeves and help. You know, both, um, all of my partners um, have worked at companies that have become very big, iconic companies in the past and gotten very large themselves and have been very hands-on, whether you know, usually in product management or founder type roles where they really are you know, driving the actual strategy of the company. Um, and so we really take a hands-on, you know, helpful position trying to help those companies become great and, and find their way through. Cool, so uh, it's a perfect segue because the focus of obvious network effects and you before becoming an investor, uh, like myself, we're entrepreneurs. Yep. Uh, you worked at some bigger companies and really always focused in, in, in product and growth aspects of those companies like Twitter, like LinkedIn, like uh, uh, Facebook, yep. and that nugget. So tell us a little bit about uh, the differences of those three as an example, as a perspective, because most people here don't know what happens inside, yep. right? So what, what's the one nugget of difference between those three that you experienced as an employee there? You know, it's funny that you call them bigger companies because when I joined, they were a lot smaller. So what size were they? What's, what number uh, were you no, there? LinkedIn was about 15 people when I joined. Twitter was about 80 people when I joined, and Facebook was about 500 when I joined. I remember talking to my friend uh, Constantine yeah. early at, at LinkedIn, right. and uh, we were having coffee and talking about our different startups. I'm like, well, is it yours going to work? I don't know. Is yours going to work? I don't know. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. LinkedIn was one of the ones that worked. Yeah, well, they, they, they figured out a lot. Look, I think, you know, I'll start with the, the, the quick similarity between all three companies, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. You know, we grew up in an era, you know, LinkedIn was founded in 2000 or launched in 2003, founded in 2002, Facebook 2004, Twitter 2007. And this was an era when Google was the big dominant company. And so everybody looked at Google as this massive, brilliant technology company that can make great technology that does everything important. And at Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, the, the whole thing was, you know, we, we definitely thought of ourselves as technology companies. We were building new products and everything else. But, but in some ways, we thought of ourselves not as technology companies. We were really just, we were more like human psychology companies giving people new tools to connect. You know, I almost joked, but it was like, we were just putting up forms that people filled out, and then we took the information they submitted to the form and shared it with more people. And there wasn't a lot of technology in the way that Google kept talking about technology back then. And that was sort of this amazing contrast. It was like, like find they understand technology, but they don't understand people. We're going to build products that deeply understand people, that get the language right, that get the words right, that get the images, the sure. faces, the, the right content so that when you are experiencing this product, you're experiencing it in a much more emotional, human way, instead of just thinking you're talking to like a black box that's masterful in technology. Right. So on the actionable pieces yeah. there, because we try to do the big picture but also drill down, as you were there and you threw things up and there were yeah. forms and content and images here, 
But, but how did you know when a couple of them worked yeah. and to double down and triple down on that, that, those features, even on the basis of a low, low level, yeah. uh, you put 10 things up in the span of a month or two, and you said, that one's it. You know, and, and because they're all trying to work on companies in the audience or maybe half the folks in the audience. You know, we spent a ton of time looking at our, at our data and really kind of understanding, you know, at LinkedIn, we spent a lot of time like on virality. At Twitter, we spent a lot of time on retention, really understanding like what was the, the overall conversion rates, what was the retention behavior. But the thing I always love to remind people and I think it's really important is, is I like to say that, the, you, know, the, you know, data is the plural of anecdote. And so you really can just be looking at all this data and talk about conversion rates and everything else, but you have to get to the meat of the underlying stories. You have to actually talk to users. So we would talk to users all the time and say, why did you sign up? What made you want to do this? Why didn't you want to sign up? And like at LinkedIn, we had a lot of people who, who didn't want to sign up because they thought LinkedIn was a job site and they want to put their resume online. So we ended up building a whole jobs product so that we could sort of say, hey, we do have a job site too. It's a little bit of a business, but if you don't enter the jobs area, LinkedIn's still really valuable for you as a professional. And then the, the other thing we spent a lot of time was on language. Like I found that we were doing virality testing for LinkedIn. And if we actually used words in the invitation, so the whole way LinkedIn grew was I would send an invite to Evan, hey, please come join my network on LinkedIn. And we would have a bunch of language. And if we had language that said like, it will make both of our networks bigger, then when Evan signed up for LinkedIn, he was more likely to invite more people. So we were able to kind of see a secondary viral effect that was even better just by tweaking the language that we put on the actual invitation. I mean, you tracked, so how are you tracking though? Because that was still earlier days and yeah. still companies are struggling with how to track the actual one word is better than the next. I mean, were you guys hacking together stuff behind the scenes or it was actually a whole analytics platform uh, or flying I, blind with this, uh, the blindfold on? This was 2004. There were none of these exactly. analytics platforms or anything like it. Um, we had a data warehouse, so every night the entire LinkedIn database was cloned into a data warehouse. And then the next day I could go in and, and tinker around the data what warehouse. Kind of I, mean, what kind I was, of just doing, what I was writing a bunch of SQL queries that were basically like selecting the group that received invite A versus invite B and figuring out like, but, but what we were able to do because we actually logged the entire chain. So we logged, if I sent an email to this email address, I could then track from the email address it was sent to what text they got. And then when they came and signed up, I could track their conversion rate and their behavior as they did. So I could join all of these things. So I could actually test from the original invitation how many people actually signed up and how many people then sent more invites. And I could start to then go the second degree too. It started to get too com complicated for my level of SQL knowledge. But um, you know, now we have much more robust virality platforms. But we were having to scratch and claw and just make it up as we went back then. Was... Uh... Before you joined there, did yeah. you know anything about SQL, or did you think it was a f kind of food from Europe, or I mean, what, 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 what's yeah. the deal? You know, did you, you just quickly teach yourself one day and say, hey, we need this, we need this, and we don't have resources, and you did yeah. it, or what, what was, what was that was, day? You know, my first job was as a programmer. I worked on a product called Real Player that some of you might remember. Yeah. yeah I mean, <laughs> trust me, when I meet like these 22-year-old founders and I say Real Player, it's like a total blank stare. Um, well, I, I, I mentioned dial-up, yeah, waiting for it, an image for a half an hour, and they're like, what? Yeah, rebuffering video. But, um, um, you know, I, I, I had been, I'd been a Windows programmer and was building the Real Player client and running the team doing that. So I had a lot of coding experience, right. but I hadn't done much database work. But, you know, given that I had already been, you know, writing code and shipping software, picking up SQL to do the basic queries I was doing were fine. But as I said, like, I, I did kind of reach my limits, and every once in a while I would write an inner join that they would come and yell at me for, for, like, taking down the data warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> we heard from Jack uh, uh, yesterday talking about the first infrastructure employee at, at Google, and yeah. we press a couple buttons, and uh, the whole system would go down. And <laughs> yeah. You had to take a bike to the office and and go turn, you know, pull off the plugs and put them back in. But that, so times have changed. Yeah, times have changed. Um, what did you learn? At, what's a our first? It's easy to talk about the good things. Yeah. Sometimes we learn from the good things. Sometimes we learn from the bad things. What's a mistake? you really screwed up that you learned the most from at one of those early companies uh, um, that, that surprised you, but you learned the most from? You know, that's, a great, that's a great question. Look, one, one of the, the biggest mistakes and, and just one of the great learnings, like I, I like to think of, of working in these companies is you're constantly making experiments. And so everything you do is an experiment. And so if you basically say, we have a thesis 
and it's either gonna work or not, and we're gonna build this thing and we'll see what happens. That way I try not to think of it as a mistake because we went in with the thesis and we tested our thesis rather than, I know this is gonna work, and then when it doesn't work, you're like disappointed. It's that psychology um, again. Did yeah, you study psychology? I, I actually did. I, 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 I knew it, it's, my, a, it's a perspective. I did this, this great program at Stanford called Symbolic Systems. It's a combination uh, okay, so of now that makes sense. linguistics, psychology, computer science, and philosophy. Um, and so, so at Twitter, when I joined Twitter, this was 2009, and Twitter had already sort of been on Oprah, and like a bunch of people had heard of Twitter, but we had this massive problem. Everybody signed up didn't stick around. And so we, we did a bunch of analysis, talked, interviewed and called a bunch of users who, who had done stuff. And, and one of the big things in the company was we have to change the Twitter homepage. If we just make Twitter easier to understand when you show up on Twitter.com, then it will grow so much better. And so like, this was just like this common thread in the company. I think it still is today. That like, if we just change the homepage, Everyone will do it. And so you know, the first project that I got started, we rebuilt our onboarding flow, and that actually worked really well. So I kind of got some credibility in the company, and they were like, oh, we can change things and actually make progress. Josh actually knows what he's yeah, doing. And well, they made a good guess, and, and it worked. And so then they were like, the next thing, let's go make the homepage. So we're like, let's go rebuild and design the homepage. Let's make it fresh with like new tweets coming in that show what's happening live. We'll show trends. We'll show all the stuff to make, make the Twitter homepage much more dynamic so you'll get a taste of Twitter. And this was replacing a page that had a big search box which if you don't know how to use Twitter and the first thing you do is type something into a search box to search Twitter, that's probably the absolute worst way to try to figure out what the heck is going on on Twitter. And, and so we, we did all these changes. We made this page. It took us like several weeks because we had to build a new algorithm that would surface the top tweets and build some editorial things that we could immediately take something out if something inappropriate happened to show up even if it was there. And then we shipped it, and we actually did an A-B test. We're like, okay, we'll, we'll ship it to half the users. And it's like very tricky to do A-B tests on logged out pages because you just have to cookie people, but they might come from a different computer. But we'll do our best analysis. And so we shipped it, and it made zero difference. Like literally, like what we learned, or what I assume that we learned is everyone who showed up to Twitter had so many preconceived notions of what it was about that actually just clicking to go sign up and hopefully we could teach them through the sign up flow made much more of an impact than whatever we put on the homepage. Mm -hmm. And it actually turned out as we kept doing more testing, actually just removing all options except for login and sign up actually performed like mildly better than everything else. Because you hooked else. them in. Because, well, just by not giving them any other ways to click and then get lost and then go away. And so it just turned out that like literally by just like not adding any features to the page but adding nothing, you know, was was by far the by, by far the best. And so for a while, and you know, they again, you know, I've been gone for the company five years, and they keep testing this stuff again. But for a long time, the Twitter homepage was basically like type in your email address and password if you're logging in, or you know, first name, last name, and email address to sign up, and like that was it because it turned out that everything else was distracting. So regarding that and and the testing that philosophy, that's the kind of psychology of not everything is going to be perfect and keep on testing. Yeah. How does that then transition to your mentality with companies that you've invested in yeah. early yeah. and come to you and or have board meetings, this isn't working, that's not working, and obviously there's some tension there. Well, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? Is this going to happen or is it not? Yeah. So how do you work with them with your deep knowledge on the product side to, to help the business get to where everybody wants to go? You know, it's funny. We, we think of investing very similar to this kind of same philosophy. And we think of company building the same way. You know, Reid Hoffman, um, who you know, founded LinkedIn, is now my partner at Credlock. You know, I, I remember um, a conversation he and I had in like 2004 where I was like, explain to me like financing and, and what that works. And he said, look, it's a series of hypothesis testing. What you do is you raise enough money to go say you're going to challenge this set of assumptions and try to see if they're true or not. And if you think you mostly prove them true, like we can build a product and people will use it a little bit and maybe they will share it with friends, then you go test the next set of assumptions, which is can we build more features or more things that will help them use it more? Or then can we build, you know, and then you raise more money to go do that. And if that works, then you're like, now we're going to turn it into a business. So then you raise a bunch more money to turn it into a business. And he says like the entire process of building a company is, is a set of hypothesis testing. And, and we very much keep that philosophy at Greylock. When we make an investment, we're not like, this better work. Like, if this doesn't work, like, we're going to fire you as a CEO and we're going to remove funding from your company. It just wouldn't work that way. It's like, we're ready to join the journey and we're excited for the next hypothesis and we're giving you this much capital right now in order to go try to prove it. And if we get towards the end of that amount of capital and we haven't proven enough of our assumptions, we should rethink what we do with the, what you've built with your own career, 
with, with where you're going. And if, by the way, we've proved them faster, whatever, we should go raise more money and get a lot more aggressive to keep going to prove them. And, and you know, I've already been, I've been, there's a couple of years now, and I've already gotten to see both sides of that journey. And, and it's, you know, it's incredible. But we just keep it as this, this testing. It's, it's never failure. It's, it's, are we testing enough? And at some point, you may decide that with this cap table and this amount of money and this set of people that you've hired on this journey, you know, maybe that's enough to, to try something new and keep going, or maybe it's time to rethink things and, you know. There's a hard question I want to ask, it's, and it's tough to pinpoint, but actionable. Some of the ones that are doing great or good yeah. to great, fantastic. They're yeah. kind of doing their thing and they have the secret sauce, whatever it is. The ones that are not are the harder ones yeah. on both sides. And there, it's kind of like if you fail once and you've learned, great. If you failed twice and you learned, okay, you might still have potential. But if you fail three, four, and five, and six times, it becomes a potentially negative trend. Yeah. So if you do the hypothesis that doesn't work for four or five, six times, is there coaching from your experience to them because you look at network effects because you've got experience yeah. in it? So what do you, give us an example of things that you said you thought that was going to work with them three or four or five times. And it either never did, or that one thing came out of nowhere just from the story behind the scenes yeah. to give people a flavor of doubling down and tripling down. How many times can I fail before I give up or not? Well, well look, I mean, um, you know, you guys might know, I invested in a company called Meerkat um, just over a year ago. I invested right before South by Southwest. I've been looking at live video and believing we were just about in a world where, you know, I've been doing live video since Real Networks. And I believe they were just a world where like mobile live video was about to happen, where everyone in this room could whip out their phone and be broadcasting live video immediately. Right. And I'd met Ben Rubin, who, by the way, Meerkat was already the third product of that company because he had started several years before and built a team in Israel that said, we're going to build something really important for live video that we think is going to be amazing. And, and when, you know, I'd gotten to know him and like we shared a lot of ideas on live video. And when Meerkat sort of popped right at kind of like late February, early March of 2015, I was like, look, Ben, like, I'm really excited. This may be the moment in time where the phones and the network capacity can handle it, where we can go do this. I'd also known that Twitter had bought Periscope, um, a different live video company, and they hadn't announced that yet or launched it, but I knew about that. And I said, I said but I'm still going to back you, and we're going to go, you know, this is going to be such a big pie that we're going to go figure out what our share of it is, you know, along with Twitter. You know, fast forward four or five months, Meerkat was actually doing reasonably well um, you know, versus Twitter. Um, you know, I think Twitter was ahead and Periscope was growing a little bit faster than Meerkat, but we, we were holding our own. And then Facebook comes out and says, we're going to do live video now within our network. And anybody who's got, you know, a celebrity or an audience on, on Facebook can just go live and go to their whole audience. And we we're like, oh, man, I don't know. I know we can maybe compete against Twitter, and that's hard. But competing against Twitter and Facebook and really just competing against Facebook really hard right, right now like facebook is they're like oh let's go live and like four billion people just like show up immediately and so <laughs> and, and that's kind of challenging to and, 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 and it's just like you know what look and, and live video is much more about the intimacy and the authentic nature i mean part of the reason that we're all here is to have much more of an authentic experience when we're in the moment versus you know something you can watch later so so it's not just about numbers but numbers do help and so anyway as we learned that through that we, we said okay this Meerkat thing that's trying to compete against broadcast live video may not be the thing. So the team is really hunkered down and is, is working on something new again. And we're seeing some really interesting kind of early positive stuff in what they're doing. You know, it's much more around kind of group social video. And, and it's like really exciting to kind of see, look, they just keep taking cracks at it. And the nice part was we, we all gave them enough capital between me and a, and a great syndicate that joined, you know, enough capital to really go still try to prove the future of live video. And it wasn't just a bet that, like, Meerkat must work or bust. It was a bet that, like, Ben and the, the great team that he's built at the company, the company's actually called Life on Air because it's about how do you live your life on air. Um, that company is going to go produce something great. And, you know, I'm still, still excited, but they also have a runway. And at some right. point... The capital, even that we gave them, might run out, and if we don't have ourselves in a position where, like, this company's worth a lot more capital, you know, then you know we'll figure out what the right thing to do with the company is. Cool. Um, relating to Meerkat, but also probably Jelly and a couple, yeah. of, several other companies that you've invested in, and we started our pre-interview kind of chat online about a couple of weeks ago. Um, with a lot of photographs yeah. of your face, which <laughs> related to the title because you think faces are the key to yeah. social platforms. So I thought that resonated with this audience and with this topic. But tell us a little bit more about why is it faces is the most 
valuable part of social platforms. You know, we, we did these um, eye tests and like heat map eye tests of like Facebook and Twitter, um, you know, back, this is now seven or eight years ago. And, and you, could, you could immediately see, just, you know, as humans, we're programmed to recognize a face and, and the shape of it almost as babies. And you could just see as people go read like a Facebook feed, when there's faces as the profile icon, people's eyes immediately gravitate towards that and then read the content. And then they go to the next one and then read the content. And, and that's a really important thing. Like when you're reading set of content on Facebook or Twitter, you may not realize it, but you're reading the name and the identity of the person and then what they say. And then the name and identity of the next person and then what they say. And that's what creates this very conversational, very human nature of the whole experience. And that is very, very hard to replace. There's other content platforms where the name and the identity isn't important. You can go to some like the anonymous platforms, like a Yik Yak, and you realize like that's just content. There's no names or faces. And you actually read it very, very differently than when you're reading stuff on Twitter or Facebook because those faces are just so key. And that identity is really what keeps people there. And you know, I, I meet people that I've been like following on Twitter for a long time and I've seen these words next to their face for a long time. And I feel like we really know each other. We've been just having this dialogue and conversation tied to their face. And then you look at Snapchat, which came out more recently, and it was like the, the most quintessential version of the face. It was like the most authentic faces. People make funny faces and awkward faces and faces before they've, you know, like clean themselves up in the morning and, and so which of those drive, faces like, are drive more traffic? You know. Did you guys get granular to the... Look, look that's at, interesting because of the facial recognition. A lot of the computer vision uh, we've discussed yeah. yesterday and today and in this sector, you know, at what point can almost the algorithms start delivering on what we understand about sentiment well, analysis, and about what the face is doing or what the personality of that person with the face is doing? You know, it's interesting. The, the things that we've seen that drive the most traffic are when the face changes. And so... You mean so, an animation it, or, like, no, or, no, or over time? No, no, over time. Huh? So actually, like, when... When you change your profile picture, the single biggest way to like get more clicks to your profile or have more people looking at it or actually getting your content, get more likes and getting more comments um, is actually to change the profile picture because all of a sudden, you know, we get used to seeing you looking the same way in conversation. And when you actually change it, um, that's actually the biggest single trigger hmm. to doing it. And, and so if you, if you want to just take this trick and go get a bunch more likes or comments or retweets or, or whatever social platform you're using, go and change your profile picture like every week or so. And like, you'll, you'll be surprised at like, whoa, that, that actually really works. Like when you get a new haircut and everybody like knows you, like nice new haircut. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's exactly the same philosophy um, to do that. I'm sure you can probably test also uh, the type of comments you get if you yeah. put an unhappy face or a depressed oh, face totally or true. versus a laughing or a... Uh, hmm. um, the Medium article, mm -hmm. talking now about some opportunities. We've talked about some deals you've already done, but you know, going forward which I thought was great um, towards the end of last year, uh, about four or five topics yep. that you wrote that you were interested in. Um, and for the audience's sake, it was live conversations, interest groups, better self-expression, preserving all the content we make, VR, AR. And now you can imagine, in addition to being a great guy and a smart operator and investor, it's very focused opportunities that relate to everything in this space. Would you have add any to that since the last five months that are, is the newest and latest greatest? You know, I mean, uh, the, so, so I think all these are really important because I think we are, we are more connected than we've ever been to people around us. And yet I think we're somewhat less fulfilled by that than we've been in a long time. Hmm. You know, I feel like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter have gotten us so good at shouting at each other. And even Snapchat stories in some sense where you're looking at each other in their best moments when you're bored on the couch or late at night or in bed, and, and we're not having as many intimate, real experiences. So a lot of the stuff around connecting people around their interest groups, connecting people in more live moments or live conversations is really about creating these much more human interactions about the stuff we care about that happens that kind of is much more enriching versus seeing somebody else having a great time at a party and the time that you're really looking at that is when you're not having a great time because that's when you have time to look at your phone. So, <laughs> so I just think there's, I think there's a lot that's going to happen there. You know, I think, I think, all of that is still stuff that I'm looking for because we haven't seen anything really transform or break out. I'm also getting more excited about you know, the Lily and some of the connected camera stuff that we're really about to see. I think, I think we're moving in a world now where we're so used to now having a phone in our pocket, but that's almost like still one too many steps. And pervasive cameras and cameras that can get a brand new perspective we never could do. Um, so Internet of Eyes. It, the, that's a great way to, I, I love your phrasing on the Internet of Eyes. Have you guys seen the hover camera? 
which is a, a new demo and it'll, it'll come live um, sometime soon. Like watching that video, it was like an actual camera that we would feel comfortable in here looking at and having it get a new perspective that, that we could never do you know, without really expensive equipment. Ask me, John, whether, you know, Lily, yeah. you know, whether or not we're all going to have our personal flying cameras hovering outside waiting for yeah. us to leave to follow us. You know, I mean, is that, is it could be a good thing and a bad thing, but I mean, that's a little odd. It's almost like a parking lot of flying <laughs> lilies waiting for us. It, it, look, I think it's really interesting. I think, look, we talked about them. Wouldn't it be great if they were silent? The problem with physics is it's actually still really hard to lift yeah. a piece of equipment and have it be silent. And, and I think it's also hard to have a camera and a computer and all this stuff with enough battery life that you know, we don't worry about it crashing on our heads. So I think we're a little bit away before it feels like something that we're like, comfortable with around all the time. So but talk I, a little bit about this. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but, but I think we're going to start seeing us wanting many more moments captured that we can actually be in the moment. I mean, the, the whole problem with the camera is you either do it with a tripod or you're never actually in the moment. You know, how many pictures? Like growing up, there's like three pictures with my dad because he was the family photographer. Right. And I think like that's going to be a big thing. One of the things that I would love is uh, basically you came from California, you flew here, you went to the airport and took whatever transportation, yeah. you walked across town or did whatever. There were a thousand cameras that you passed. Yeah. You don't control the access of that content. But what if you could? And there was, they'd say, oh, Josh just arrived here. These are three pictures. Do you want them? Or they should be sent to you. Yeah. as a service. But that identity tracking, people look at internet of eyes, sometimes negatively, sometimes positively. Yeah. That's the positive side of, I think we are in many places, but why do we have to make a picture or have yeah. somebody else? There are pictures being captured, no, which I, have value. I, I think that's a great point. And I think, I think as we move into this world, you know, at, at some level, there's a massive debate about privacy. But, but I think the reality is it's always this trade-off between privacy and convenience, or privacy and connectivity and privacy. Isn't and, like, privacy dead? Uh, look, at some level, privacy is dead. At some at level. most level. I mean, yeah. it's, it's pretty much dead. You know, we grew up, look, in the United States, I feel comfortable saying, look, there really isn't anything I'm doing that is so private that I worry about being used against me. You know, I, I do respect that people from other environments and even in the political environment we may be entering here, that like people may actually get a lot more worried about actually the things that I'm naturally doing could start being used against you. So I don't think privacy and encryption is going to be dead until we really live in a world where you know, we don't have despots or governments or, or other criminal activity that can really kind of root Well, that's always out. going to exist, unfortunately. But I mean, I'm a very private person with many things, yeah. and there are other aspects that I'm very public. We're here on stage, yeah. and we're very social and sharing views online, but there's aspects that I want to be private. Yeah. But I still believe because of the growth in technology and the evolution of what's going on, privacy to what we know it is definitely dead. I, I think it's fair to say that, that the expectation of true privacy in anything we do is pretty much dead. I think... Okay, now, let's I, move on. We agree. <laughs> well, but, but, no, but, but, but I think there's a really important thing, which is I think, look, it's, it's sort of like obfuscation is going to be the key. Like, mm -hmm. like sure. my, I don't really share much about the fact that I have a child on Twitter. So like, if you really follow me on Twitter, you could barely detect that I have a kid. Mm -hmm. But if you follow me on Facebook or on Snapchat, like I'm very public or on those platforms about my kids. So I actually think we're going to get much more into selective sharing. And I think we're going to see a lot more happen. That's a great question. So I've got, uh, let's get the uh, guys with the mics. We're going to have to start having questions. We've got about seven minutes left. So anybody has questions, raise their hand in a second. So regarding that question of sharing, you specifically said you don't share photos of your kid or talk about it yeah. on Twitter. So where do you like to share what photos? Do you have a mental like filter or is it just a natural uh, process that's evolved? So what do you share on Snapchat yeah. versus Twitter? Um, well, look, on, on, on Twitter, you know, and having worked at the company and sort of having sort of lived this slightly more public life, you know, I, I love talking about everything that goes on in technology that comes to my mind. I have love talking about things around sports. I'm a huge Seattle Seahawks fan. Um, I like that's talking. Twitter or is that Snapchat? That, this, this, all, this is mostly Twitter, Twitter. Okay. Um, because I find that that's where I get the most engaging conversations around topics of, of technology and that and a little bit of politics and a little bit of like world things that are happening, you know. On Facebook and on Snapchat, I'm much more curious about who my friends are and the people that I'm sharing with. I just share much more about life. Like, sometimes it's a little bit about work, but a lot of times it's more about, like, my personal life and family. My mom likes just about everything I ever post on Facebook. That, and, I mean, and, that's a good thing. And, I mean, a great if she thing. didn't, does it upset you? No, but, well, sometimes. <laughs> but, but, but she doesn't need to like everything that quickly. But, uh, oh, so that's a sensitive <laughs> issue. Like, well, why did you like, not see it? I mean, did you not like it enough? Do you ask um, her? 
No, no, it's, it's, well, it's just like, okay, like, do other things other than Facebook all the time, waiting for me to post. She's waiting for you. She exactly. wants to live vicariously your life. Um, um, but, <laughs> I know, it's, it's great. Um, but, but, but I do, like, think about, like, like, I just try to share, like, real life there. And, and on Twitter, I just don't feel as comfortable living, you know, normal life publicly. And, like, sometimes, look, like, we all have our first world problems that we occasionally whine about. And, you know, you're, like, it's fun to do that with the right group of friends. And it's embarrassing sure. to do that on on Twitter when everybody just like yells at you for like, why are you complaining about, you know, your Uber going too slow? So. Uh, questions, who's first? Over here, Rick. Oh, all right, oh, who's got a mic? Okay, go first. Hi, Rick Smolin. Um, I thought that LinkedIn's uh, purchase of lynda.com was brilliant. I was on an airplane the other day and you can spend six hours now learning Photoshop yeah. or whatever you want. Um, I'm curious how that decision was made. And then likewise, all of a sudden LinkedIn's Share price dropped in half on one day, which terrified the whole market. I'm just curious. It seemed to me that the opposite should have happened after Lynda.com. I'm just curious if you could talk about those two. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not I involved in LinkedIn or yeah, I'm a shareholder, but other than being, you know, partners at, at Greylock with, with the founder. So, so these comments are like totally not associated with the company at all. But, but look, LinkedIn, you know, from the very beginning was like, how do we actually help your professional life? And like we talked about this in 2000. And, and four, when I and five, when I was there, which is like, how do we help you be a better professional? And obviously, one of the ways was give you access to your network and give you access to your network's network, so you can actually reach people in a way that you didn't need it. And and you know, as much as people talk about the hiring use case, we used to spend a lot of time talking about the expertise use case. If I want to find somebody who is an expert in Photoshop or is an expert in privacy or is an expert in the the legality of something, we we really wanted LinkedIn to be the place you could do that. And as they've gotten more into like empowering the economic development of everybody, you know, they realize that giving you the platform to learn and create skills were, were incredibly important. And Linda, by far, was the leading platform that had created so much great content, had so much educational ways to create great skills. LinkedIn just saw as we move forward and we try to help professionals be better, um, they saw that as a great fit. And, and I think so far, you know, I hope it's been working really well for them. But I think that the future of a platform where LinkedIn knows more about me as a professional than any, anywhere else, it can really help me be even better, I think is going to be great. Um, in terms of the share price, you know, I think the stock markets and the innovation that's happening in companies is sometimes out of whack and doesn't always understand. And, and it's LinkedIn's job to keep building a great business and prove it. Okay, over there, and then the second one, next one's over here with Jesse. Hi, Josh. Uh, Hi. Adora, Rothenberg Ventures. I'm just wondering about what your thoughts are on what some consider the VR, AR hype and what others don't. Yeah. Good question. Um, so look, if, if you were to ask me in five years, will everybody have a VR experience on a frequent basis, you know, whether that's like weekly or a couple times a month, or will AR be something that will be much more pervasive? I think the answer to that is you know, probably yes. Like, I'd be really surprised if it's not. But if you ask me if that's in two years, I don't know. Like, I've, you know, I think VR is like a great entertainment experience right now, but I haven't been comfortable in there where I've wanted to stay in for a long time and keep having the rest of these immersive experiences. I think there's a lot of physical technology improvement still to happen, let alone all the content and great experiences that can get created. So I think we're, I think we're overhyped in the short term, but, but probably not overhyped in the long term, sort of in the same way the internet was in 1999, which was like, yes, all these things will happen online. It will be incredible. But it might not happen in two years. Which is um, one of the biggest challenges as an investor, yeah. isn't it? So what, when to invest yeah. in, in those people? You know, so so that's, that's the thing. We've made, I think, one um, uh, uh, stealth VR investment. But our theory is like small teams building things that can be really core building blocks that as it emerges can sort of scale up with it gets us really much more excited than a bunch of companies that are spending a heck of a lot of money right now to build all the demos and everything else. I, I by the way, think most of the way that most people are going to experience VR is going to be outside their own home over the next year and a half or two years because very few people have the devices, but you'll go over to your friend's house. But I think even more, there's going to be a lot of physical locations we'll be able to go to that will become fun, kind of like what arcades used to be. You know, and then in a few years, it'll get back into all of our homes. Good analogy. Jesse. Josh, um, so we in the media this spring really like to write about bots. <laughs> What's it going to take for bots to go from hype to something that actually is relevant for people? So I think it's a great question about bots. I mean, look, we love talking about VR and bots because we know that they're new things that are really important. And yet... <laughs> Siri's talking to you. It <laughs> and, felt your thoughts. So that bot just came. Look, the number, of, the, the number of hours people spend in messaging apps is like going up exponentially every single year. 
And right now, we're all really good at talking to our friends. And we, the first time that I want to like talk to a friend now, I don't think about phone calling them. I don't even think about like, like I think about messaging them and getting a message back. And yet when we want to talk to businesses, we want to talk about information elsewhere, we like, you kind of have to call a business or go to their website or do something else. We're actually like messaging actually is often the best interface. But I think we still are kind of confusing about bots right now. Like the NLP isn't quite there. We have very high expectations that if we say something, we expect a human on the other side to understand it and respond back. And NLP is close, but not quite there. So none of these experiences are great. And you like start to learn this really cryptic language to interact with your bot. So I think we're a few years out on the bots being natural to represent everything. But I think in the shorter term, we're going to see all this business behavior, all the phone IVR trees, press one for this, press two for this, way better done in a bot. Just open up Messenger, type in the name of the business like Comcast, go through the exact phone tree, and you can actually do everything so much faster than you could sitting on the phone. And so I think we're going to see all of that happen in the short term. And I also think we're going to see bots that are like content delivery, whether it's your shipment just got mailed or a daily newsletter or breaking news alerts pushed into your messaging because that's where you're spending all your time and, and where you're doing all your content. So the interactive bots, I think, are going to take a little bit longer to play out. But I do think that much shorter term, we're going to do a lot more in messaging than just message friends. All right, a couple of last questions to end off, and these are fun and challenging questions. Uh, why do most entrepreneurs not succeed? Because it's really, really, really hard to take a great idea, a great group of people, build it, hit the right market at the right time, and get it in the hands. I mean, just it's it, you have to think of it instead of why don't most succeed? How the hell do the couple that really do like really Both succeed? Them. Right, like like. like it's so much luck, and you can do all this hard work and get in a great position, and if you don't also get lucky at the same time to capitalize on all that hard work you've done, like, it just doesn't happen, and, and it doesn't always happen. And I, I didn't mean to be negative, but it's a both, both of those are the right ways to look at it, and relating to that, one of the questions I love asking all investors, because it's actionable, I think, for the audience, you speak to a lot of entrepreneurs. Your favorite personality trait of an entrepreneur, in one word, answer? and your hated personality trait of an entrepreneur in one word answer. Um, so uh, we're at a vision summit, so the number one word I would use is vision. Um, just somebody who can paint this picture of a world five years from now and just like get me excited and intoxicated about that. Um, the other word I like to use, I'll, I'll give you two, is learner. Somebody who's constantly learning and processing new information and coming up with new theories on the world. Like the, the most hated arrogant trait is, is what's a non-listener? Like just somebody who, who doesn't listen and learn and, and interact that way. Cool. Mine would be, as I said yesterday, passion. Uh -huh. um, and actually for me, it's selfish, a CEO that's selfish. That's and that, some point. might like that because they're going to do it no matter what. But if they're not a team player um, and thinking about the whole ecosystem, I think they're deemed to fail. Uh, Josh, thank you very much. Thanks, it's fantastic. Kevin. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure. <laughs>